ka tangi te titi, ta ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi hoki ahau, ti hei Māori ora. Uh, the seabird cries, uh, the mountain birds cry, even I cry out, uh, behold the breath of life. Ana mana, ana ria, ara raka te rama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā kātou katoa. Um, kia ora and welcome. Uh, welcome to everyone here at the University of Otago for this uh, 2019 Matariki lecture from uh, Professor Jane Lydon of University of Western Australia. And for those of you uh, either here or watching on live stream or in the recording, with particularly good eyesight, you might notice that I'm wearing a tie that's got swans on it that is in fact a UWA tie as, an, as a member of the network. You can come and look at me after that to see if you want. And I think Jane will be able to take an order for one. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight. I'm Richard Blakey. I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research and Enterprise here at the University of Otago. And we're very proud to be hosting the 2019 Matariki Lecture uh, in this, the uh, 150th anniversary year for the University of Otago. Um, to those of you live streaming or uh, viewing from around the network or elsewhere uh, in the world, welcome, welcome and thrice welcome. And just um, I'll say a few little words about what the Matariki Lecture is before I hand over uh, to Professor Tony, Tony Ballantyne to introduce our speaker. Uh, the Matariki Network is a network of seven fine universities from around the world uh, established in 2011 to help support uh, cooperation and collaborative efforts in student exchange, research and other areas. Uh, these universities all sharing characteristics of being uh, fine, comprehensive universities with uh, a long-standing tradition for, for excellence in academic activities, um, covering, spanning the globe, so uh, from Europe, uh, Durham, Tubingen, uh, Uppsala from North America, Queens and Dartmouth, and from Australasia, University of Western Australia and Otago. And um, since 2017, we've been holding a, uh, a lecture across the network, the Matariki Lecture, to showcase research across that network, and in particular to hi highlight areas where there's collab collaboration or cooperation, uh, and we'll see an example of that tonight. Um, the, the two previous lectures, I won't give their titles, were hosted in Queens with a lecturer from Dartmouth, and in Tubingen with a lecturer from Durham, so that's North America meets North America, Europe meets Europe, and this time we've got Oceania meets Oceania, with Western Australia coming to Otago. Um, and by my calculation, this series of lectures offers a wonderful and fantastic opportunity over the next 39 years to get every possible combination working where every university hosts a lecture over the series with a different lecturer from one of the other different we've had. So that's seven times six is 42 combinations. So the, by the time we get to the universities of, of Otago's bicentennial, we should be well, uh, well into the second round of Matariki um, lectures. Um, so I will hand over to Tony shortly, but if, firstly, I just want to acknowledge that for those local in the audience, uh, Bronwyn from University Bookshop is here. Uh, Jane has uh, we'll be talking about some work that is encompassed in, uh, in a book, so those books are available from the front of the theatre for those who are interested afterwards. Uh, but now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Tony Ballantyne, the Pro Vice-Chancellor from the Division of Humanities, uh, to introduce Jane, but also in his role as one of the co-conspirators, I would say, for the Centre for Research on Colonial Culture, which is one of the universities of Otago's um, research centres to um, identify that this, this uh, lecture hasn't happened by accident. It is representing an area of really strong co-interest across the network. Uh, and Tony will be much better placed to give you a more meaningful introduction to the lecture on imperial emotions than I am. So I'll now w willingly hand over to Tony. Thank you very much. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko o te manakura o te kete aranui ki te whāriwā nanga nei, uh, ko Tony Ballantyne ahau tēnei te mihi ki a koutou katoa. Uh, my name is Tony Ballantyne, as Richard said, I'm the PBC Humanities here at Otago, but I'm also a Professor of History, um, and I'm really delighted to be able to introduce our speaker, Professor Jane Lydon. Before I do so, I'm going to say a little bit about the Matariki Network from a humanities angle. Um, it is a really important global network of universities, a set of outstanding research-led universities deeply committed to excellent student experiences and with a global orientation. For us in the humanities, the network is really important 
as a set of trusted partners who we can share ideas with and innovations, uh, with whom we can share problems and work through those issues with, and with whom we can pursue exciting new research and teaching collaborations. And as Professor Blakey uh, identified, there are some really strong shared interests between UWA and Otago around Indigenous histories, the histories of uh, colonialism and its afterlife. Um, it is also a network that enables um, some incredibly exciting student-focused developments, uh, in particular our fantastic Indigenous student mobility program. So it does really great things in the world. And speaking of people who do great things in the world, I'm delighted to introduce Jane Lydon. That's a very smooth segue. <laughs> um, so uh, Jane is a fantastic scholar, and I'm really delighted to be able to uh, introduce her. Uh, Jane is the West Farmers Chair in Australian History at the University of Western Australia. I really think of her as a scholar of rare range, um, producing important work on archaeology, collections and museums, visual anthropology and the history of photography, the history of colonialism, humanitarianism and human rights. And if I look at, across our audience tonight, I can see various people who connect with those uh, particular disciplinary traditions or scholarly interests. Um, she has produced a large and important range of uh, chapters, articles, edited collections and monographs, perhaps best known, as people often are, for their first really big monograph, uh, her 2006 Duke University Press volume, Eye Contact, uh, Photographing Indigenous Australians. But more recently, she's produced a number of very important works that illuminate the Australian colonial past and its afterlives, as well as the history of humanitarianism. These include the monograph, uh, The Flash of Recognition, Photography and the Emergence of Indigenous Rights, the collection co-edited with Lyndall Ryan, and of course Lyndall's been at the forefront of documenting the histories of violence and massacres in colonial Australia. Uh, that was called Remembering the Mile Creek Massacre, perhaps of course the most famous or notorious of those events, and the edited volume, Visualising Human Rights. Her most recent book, is Imperial Emotions. This is very hot off the press uh, from Cambridge University Press, The Politics of Empathy Across the British Empire. I was very lucky to be one of the readers for this book. It is absolutely fantastic, not only in its rich excavation of the colonial past, but for exploring a range of issues that are absolutely central in our global moment today, particularly around what we might think of as the politics of recognition. So in a way, it frames many of the comments tonight, I'm sure, but I'm delighted to pass over uh, to Professor Jane Lydon. Okay, so thank you very much for that, those lovely introductions. Um, and normally, at home in Perth, I would uh, give an acknowledgement um, of, of country um, because I live and work on the traditional country of the Wadjuk Noongar people uh, of southwestern Western Australia. But as I'm here, um, please forgive my accent, but I will attempt to make a more local acknowledgement. So I'd like to acknowledge the Mana Fenua Kai Tahu Fanui. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so we, 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 you've just heard about the Matariki Network and, and the lecture tonight, so I'd just like to say that I'm really honoured to be asked to, to come here and talk about um, this new research with you this evening. So I want to talk about the ways that emotions created relationships that spanned the British Empire um, and indeed helped to constitute the empire. Over the next 45 minutes, I want to look at the, um, the emotions aroused by images and narratives about frontier violence, race and empire and conclude by considering public debates about an Australian Republic. So I want to start by explaining a little bit about the research field of the emotions and how my study is drawn upon it. And some of you, I understand, do work in this area, so um, you'll, you'll be familiar with this. Over the last three decades, growing interest uh, in the, the emotions has demonstrated their cultural and historical plasticity or variability. What might seem to be the universal experience and expression of the emotions has instead been shown to have varied tremendously across time and place. 
So, for example, from the 1980s, anthropologists argued that emotions are not just an individual response, not just something we feel in our bodies, but are constituted by the politics of social life and play an important role in everyday political interaction. In history, this research field uh, emerged most immediately during the 1990s from gender history. Uh, this challenged the opposition between the supposedly domestic, feminine, private sphere on the one hand and the rational male public domain, showing these to be a historical construction with little basis in fact. Such work demonstrated the importance of gender as a means of naturalising social hierarchies uh, and the differential distribution of power. So, like gender, emotions, which are supposedly so closely linked to the private female domain, can instead be shown to pervade all aspects of life and to define central categories in culture, politics and science. And we can probably all think of examples. Um, in Australia, our Prime Minister Scott Morrison, for example, last year, in talking about our very controversial poli um, policies of, of offshore detention and particularly detaining children in these places, uh, said that he's been on his knees and in tears um, in, in feeling for their plight. So, um, without going into too much detail about that particular example, I think we can see that he belongs to a long tradition of politicians um, showing themselves as compassionate and morally, morally driven as a way of justifying their political um, views. One central question in this field has concerned the relationship between universally experienced bodily responses, um, often considered the, the domain of scientists, uh, and especially neuroscientists, and their cultural expression. So, for example, um, the blush. A broad scholarly consensus distinguishes between the biological and embodied nature of affects and the social and cultural expression of emotions, although most now accept that these um, domains are not opposed, but are, are closely um, entangled. Another crucial question is how to access the emotional life of people in the past. How do we interpret their expressions, usually conveyed in language, performance, or visual imagery, to understand their actual emotional states? A range of useful approaches have been developed that tend to emphasise the collective, normative aspects of emotional cultures. So, in exploring imperial uh, emotions, I've examined what's been termed the systems of feeling, or the emotional regimes that define what members of emotional communities consider valuable um, or harmful, and which therefore generate emotions. But conversely, of course, uh, systems of feeling also determine which emotions are devalued or ignored, such as the often derided royal watchers who follow the activities of members of the royal family with great passion. So I'll, I'll be coming back to them a bit later. So to understand these past systems of feeling, I focused on what's sometimes termed the imperial, com imperial commons a lively empire-wide print culture through which the Victorian press gave readers a sense of their shared world. Best-selling books such as Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, or Bleak House by Charles Dickens circulated across the globe and were translated into diverse contexts and, es and especially local um, situations. Uh, and visual culture, I believe, provides an especially important means of accessing historical emotions through arousing feelings in the viewer and forming relations between Britain and her colonies and between settlers and indigenous people. In this work, I've been especially fascinated by the operation of empathy. Uh, this term is now understood to embrace the constellation um, of, of what we call, might call the compassionate emotions. So feeling with or for others has prompted emotional relationships defined variously over the last two centuries as pity, sympathy, fellow feeling, compassion and empathy, for example. So some people are a bit shocked by this because um, emotion scholars like to be very careful and precise in, um, in, in distinguishing between these different categories and terms at different times. Um, and, and particularly, I think, because empathy is a term only introduced into English in the early 20th century. 
It's a translation of the German term Einfühlung or feeling into. So it might seem anachronistic to use it in explaining uh, emotional histories over the longer period. But I've used terms such as sympathy or humanitarian within the historical context, uh, but I also use the term empathy in a more inclusive sense to refer to these slippery and overlapping different um, emotional categories. This has also allowed me to draw upon the extensive recent critical scholarship focused upon empathy and its effects. So empathy united dispersed communities and linked the metropolis and her colonies, but also served to exclude, particularly on racial grounds. <clears throat> so this brings me to my first example. Uh, during the period of Britain's colonial expansion in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, an especially powerful discourse of humanitarian sensibility emerged through the anti-slavery movement. Um, so here you see the kind of logo of the anti-slavery movement, Charles um, Wedgwood's medallion, uh, the kneeling shackled slave with the words, not sure whether you can read them, around the edge it says, am I not a man and a brother? And this became the immediately recognisable symbol of the abol abolitionist movement. So this, the movement reached a triumphant conclusion in August 1833, when Par British Parliament finally abolished slavery throughout the British colonies. So at, at this time, and, and following this kind of triumphant um, the conclusion of the campaign, uh, the, the 1830s became a, deca a decade when the humanitarian desire to protect indigenous peoples throughout the empire was supported by the powerful emotional clout of the anti-slavery movement. But of course, in the colonies, in places like New South Wales, this view clashed with the local realities of frontier violence at precisely the same time. So in turn, I think for us, sort of talking about these issues today, this evokes a very emotional struggle in our own time, uh, which in Australia is called the History Wars, which really reached a climax at, at the turn of the millennium. So in Australia, this was a battle between those who asserted a vision of, a, of the Australian past as a peaceful settlement we can all be proud of, against those who argued for recognition of indigenous dispossession and suffering. A prominent strand of critique focused on the forensic analysis of archival sources and estimates of numbers of casualties, a highly politicised historical discussion that aroused widespread public interest, including from our political leaders. However, some Aboriginal people expressed distaste for the mode in which this debate was conducted. They considered that its emphasis on archives was of less significance than the moral implications of this history and pointed out that Indigenous perspectives had been overlooked. So to give you one example of this, um, Tony Birch is a Koori uh, writer and historian based in Melbourne and he, he, he wrote quite an important essay. So I'll just quote very briefly from that. He said, and we know, we know the truth of this history, but how do we, how do we respond to this knowledge? We wage a war around the footnotes so that the waters of truth can be muddied enough that we can no longer see our reflection. So I think this is a beautiful metaphor for the way that this debate um, really focused on, um, a, a, in a very narrow way, on archival records. So I think as his critique suggests, other aspects of this colonial, of colonial conflict I think have been neglected. And it seems to me that visual images are an important means for historians and others to access the past and return us to the emotional and moral intensity of frontier violence. Images express the anger, fear and compassion felt by white colonists and demonstrate the ways that these emotions were politicised to legitimate colonial interests by aligning viewers with white colonists or seeking to evoke compassion for Aboriginal people Images define whose lives are valuable and therefore worthy of compassion. For example, a dominant settler narrative casts colonists as victims of Indigenous aggression and Aboriginal people were caricatured as savages. We see this in images of the, infa of the infamous Major Nuns campaign. So m many of you will have heard of the Mile Creek Massacre. Tony has mentioned it already. But this was part of a months-long campaign that was fought uh, in uh, northern New South Wales. Uh, and 
in, in late 1837 and early 1838 along the upper Guiri River on Namoy, Wirriurai and Camilleroy country. So this led to many clashes including in January 1838 uh, at Waterloo Creek where one of the participants later estimated that from 40 to 50 Aboriginal people were killed. This image by Colonel uh, Godfrey Charles Mundy is an imagined depiction. He wasn't actually there at the time. But he's showing us the opposing forces arrayed on either side of a creek, which is actually quite a common um, organisation. This is a desperate battle, but it is not between equals. The Aboriginal foe is depicted as primitive and savage. Mundy's image was a stereotype of frontier conflict, widely reproduced in imperial print culture. It sought to align viewers with the dominant troopers and showed Aboriginal people as subordinate and less than human. And there are a number of aspects of this that you can see. You know, the Indigenous people are shown uh, as naked, the, the, um, the soldiers are incredibly well equipped uh, and so forth. But responses to the Mile Creek Massacre just a few months after Waterloo Creek were very different. This is perhaps in part because the victims were primarily women and children uh, and, and the elderly. This squatter atrocity was per perpetuated in the chaotic aftermath of Nunn's military campaign and indeed marked a horrifying climax of violence. However, it also represented a unique moment of white recognition of injustice. So then, you know, as, as so often, this is about the white settler perspective. At Mile Creek in June 1838, a group of 11 stockmen murdered around 33 Wirriurai people. Um, they, ran, they, they came galloping up to a shepherd's hut where the, the women, children and elderly people were camped. They rounded them up, they tied them together with a rope uh, and then they led them to a creek bed where they were hacked or clubbed to death and then decapitated, including the children. So what made this case unique um, in historical terms was that 11 of the 12 assassins were arrested and brought to trial. And following two trials, so the first time round, the men were all acquitted, um, but the Attorney General immediately brought them to trial again, and this time seven of the accused were convicted and hanged. And this remains unique in Australian history. <clears throat> Within three years following the Mile Creek Massacre, a remarkable image circulated widely across the British Empire. An engraving uh, titled Australian Aborigines Slaughtered by Convicts uh, was published in the popular 1841 compendium, The Chronicles of Crime, or the New Newgate Calendar, showing the chain group of victims being dragged along by ruffians on horseback. As you can see, it depicts a terrible prologue to massacre. So this is the scene that the, the, um, the latest white eyewitness testified to in court as he watched the group being taken away. To contemporary viewers, anti-slavery rhetoric and imagery provided an immediately recognisable framework for, for, rec for um, interpreting this scene. So as you can see here, the, um, the upraised shackled hands of, um, of the woman at the back perhaps evoke the anti-slavery medallion, the Wedgwood medallion that I've shown you. And in the foreground here, this, this sort of oddly static kind of vignette perhaps recalls the Pieta or the Lamentation of Christ. Again, um, a, a very prominent um, Christian motif that, um, that many would have seen and understood that I think underlined the sacrificial status of the victims. The women look upwards as if for divine assistance. At the same time though, I think we can see that the image exaggerates the brutality of the perpetrators. They're, they're rendered evil and almost inhuman in a kind of reversal that was also very typical of anti-slavery rhetoric um, when the white slave owners were, were, um, were, were turned into the monsters. Mundy's image directed the viewer's sympathy toward the manly British soldier. By contrast, Fizz's sympathetic rendition of the unoffending victims of Mile Creek emphasises the helplessness and femininity of the victims, nearly all women and children. So we can see how colonial feelings of hate, contempt and fear had the effect of diminishing and distancing Aboriginal people, as in the first image, countering humanitarian attempts 
to arouse empathy towards them. And of course there's a lot more to say about this event and these images, but I just want to give you some idea of the way these sorts of visual strategies worked. Today, under the guidance of Auntie Sue Blacklock, who we see here on the left, um, an annual commemoration of the atrocity has become a means of reconciliation as descendants of perpetrators and victims meet to make peace in June each year. This grassroots ceremony has been seen um, by some people as a form of transitional justice. It's one of, and it's one of the few, I think, where, where descendants of both sides come together. Okay, so I'll move on now um, and talk a little bit about missionaries. Missionaries provide a rich focus for the analysis of the compassionate emotions in imperial context, especially the Christian ethos of pity, love and compassion. Uh, love was unconditional and inclusive, as expressed in Christ's new commandment, love each other as I have loved you. However, this empathetic emotional stance existed in tension with the injunction, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. 1 Timothy 5.8, for those of you uh, who are interested. So around 1849, there was a backlash against missionary work, however, and this was exemplified in a very high-profile public debate um, and an explicit and racialized opposition between evangelization and metropolitan urban reform that emerged um, in, 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 this particular, in this very high-profile exchange between political theorists Thomas Carlyle and John Stuart Mill. Carlyle's notorious occasional discourse on the Negro question attacked the hypocrisy of the anti-slavery movement, which he argued overlooked the problems faced by poor white British people. In rebuttal, Mill published his own essay titled The Negro Question the following year, which rejected the idea that one kind of human beings are born servants to another kind. These arguments were grounded in binaries constructed between home and foreign domestic and imperial responsibilities. They were crystallised by two wildly popular sentimental novels published in the early 1850s. American Harriet Beecher Stowe's phenomenally successful anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Life Among the Lowly, as you see here, sought to evoke compassion for slaves, not to be emancipated in North America until the end of the Civil War in 1865. By contrast, Charles Dickens' Bleak House directed audiences to care about white waifs, with the inference that black people were not a, not a proper object of compassion. Some contemporaries contrasted the moral logic of Bleak House unfavourably with that of Uncle Tom's Cabin and saw Dickens' novel as a direct attack on the abolitionist cause, so that in one sense, Bleak House may be seen as a retort to Stowe's anti-slavery novel. First, the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin. In the US, the novel's credited with playing a significant cultural role in directing public opinion in the lead-up to the American Civil War. As popular myth has it, when Stowe met President Abraham Lincoln, he shook her by the hand and said, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that made this big war. I think that's a slightly apocryphal <laughs> story, but anyway. The book sold 300 copies in its first year and became the most famous novel of the 19th century. So, can I just ask, has anyone here read Uncle Tom's Cabin? A few, few people have. So, for those of you who haven't, it's essentially about um, the family ties that are sort of cruelly torn apart by slavery. Um, and it, it sort of revolves around Eliza and her family and their escape to freedom in Canada. But again and again, you know, these family ties are severed and slave owners are shown to be brutal and, and callous in what they do. And there's an amazing scene quite close to the start of the novel where Eliza overhears that her, her baby is about to be sold away and so she runs away with him in the night. The slave catches, um, catch up with her early the next morning but she, she performs this amazing escape across the Ohio River which is covered in ice flows. Uh, so I, I won't read it out but it, it's it really sort of sweeps you along. It's this you know, amazing scene. And I must confess that I, I actually find these novels 
quite powerful and, and moving even, even today. So I, I urge you to, um, to, to read them for yourselves. So, so this is the kind of, and, it, and it's very sensational and emotional and, and quite um, overpowering. So already by December 1852, reviewers were, were referring to the Tom mania that had overtaken the mob as the novel's commodification took the form of stage performances, songbooks, ornaments, dolls and even wallpaper. Uncle Tom's Cabin was translated into many contexts as its themes of injustice, escape from oppression and human rights were fluidly interpreted across national and cultural borders. Uh, so, for example, in Attacking Slavery in Brazil and in a Yiddish version performed in New York in 1900. Over time, however, changing reading practices but also shifting um, political and social attitudes uh, towards African Americans produced radical alterations to its form and meaning. And so in the United States by the 1890s, it was primarily performed as a kind of burlesque and many of its characters had been turned into caricatures. Australian audiences retained considerable sympathy for Uncle, Tom Cabin's, Uncle Tom's Cabin's uh, depiction of slavery, even as satirical and, and, and burlesque versions proliferated in the United States. Theatrical adaptations of Uncle Tom's Cabin immediately sprang up. So by early 1853, the novel had been dramatised for Australian audiences and it became the most frequently performed play of 19th century Australia. However, such audiences generally failed to recognise the parallels between the plight of African-American slaves and of Indigenous, Australia, um, indigenous Australians. So in, in broad terms, the novel was invoked um, in defining Aboriginal conditions as slavery at moments of scandal. So very rarely, in fact, when the extreme brutality of working conditions, family separation or physical coercion could be rendered in stark terms. Conditions in northern Western Australia were framed in this way, for example, from the late 19th century, um, and also in Queensland. So what we're looking at here on the left is uh, the cover from, I think, a British edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, and it says, scenes daily and hourly acting under the shadow of American law. But on the right, this is the cover from an Australian book published in the 1890s uh, by Arthur Vogan, who was a journalist and artist, who, um, who framed his, his story of, of violence on the frontier in northern Queensland very explicitly in terms of anti-slavery uh, and indeed Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel. Uh, at the same time, however, the sentimental ideology of the home, which was kind of glorified by Stowe's novel, justified the confinement of Aboriginal people on reserves and the destruction of families under assimilation policies that um, in Australia we term the stolen generations. Places such as the Grafton Aboriginal Reserve that we see here were perceived as Australian Uncle Tom's cabins, um, which is quite an offensive way of, 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 of framing this actually in the present. Uh, as, as Aboriginal colleagues that I have talked to um, make very clear. Um, but clearly, the sentimentalisation of the ideology of the private home through the novel and others like it made the institutions of assimilation possible. The Aboriginal the Aboriginal reality underlying this romantic view was exposed when critics of Aboriginal treatment drew upon Uncle Tom Cabin analogies to protest the removal of children from their families by force. And there are a number of examples of this, but one particularly powerful one comes from 1925 when, when residents of Grafton, so the nearest country town in New South Wales to this place, this mission, uh, read of four children torn from parents in a matter that reads like a chapter from Uncle Tom's Cabin. So again, this is a very emotional moment. And what was unusual about it, perhaps, was that it was witnessed by white townspeople who knew the family and the parents uh, and were able to protest. So Bunjalung elder Robin Bancroft, who I've talked to about this, notes that this story had a uniquely happy ending, perhaps because of this white witnessing of what was going on. Um, and, and they you know, were therefore able to challenge the Aboriginal board. So for modern Australian readers, Uncle Tom's Cabin irresistibly evokes the tragedy and, and the, the very sad story of um, the stolen generations. 
as revealed by um, a, a major 1997 inquiry called Bringing Them Home. Um, the report also exposed a history of denying Aboriginal emotions. So, for example, the Aboriginal protector, which is an official term, James Isdell, wrote in 1909 that he would not hesitate for one moment to separate any half-caste from its Aboriginal mother, no matter how frantic her momentary grief might be at the time. They soon forget their offspring. Which, you know, is obviously a fantasy of primitive emotions. Similarly, when Bringing Them Home was released in 1997, the Aboriginal Affairs Minister at the time, John Heron, said that the report was very emotive and one-sided and focused only on one view of the separation process. His government refused to acknowledge responsibility for policies of forced removal or to make an apology for them. Nonetheless, um, I think across the mainstream community, many did express outrage, shock and shame. You know, people were horrified by what was revealed by the report. But again, some theorists, such as Sarah Ahmed, suggest that public expressions of shame, so the sorry books that many Australians signed, are acts that align one with other well-meaning individuals and transfer bad feeling to the subject of shame, quickly allowing one to move on and, and to sort of feel absolved. So this is one of the critiques of empathy, in fact, that it, um, it, it unhelpfully allows us to draw a line between past and present. But I'd suggest that some people are in fact um, very moved by their encounter with Aboriginal stories to implement positive um, changes. So this, this is just one example that really struck me. Um, a, a chief judge of the family court told how uh, he was talking to elders in Dubbo, which is in western New South Wales, and one, one, woman's, one grandmother I spoke to told me she would spend many days walking up and down outside her grandchildren's school to make sure nobody took the children. And he said this made such an impact on him, he wanted to do more than make a, a token gesture, but to actually change the way these processes were managed. So without suggesting that bringing them home is the Australian Uncle Tom's Cabin, common to both was an effective strategy constituted by powerful stories of child removal and broken family ties. So where many critics have deemed sentimental narratives such as the novel bad or complicit with inequality, um, I suggest that we mustn't lose sight of empathy's radical social potential. The risks of empathy are surely lesser than those entailed by a lack of sympathy for other people's suffering. And I think this is where the scholarly um, theorisation of empathy, which has tended to conclude that it, as I say, masks inequalities, and, you know, we feel sorry for somebody but then we just kind of carry on and it's business as usual, I think that's very much at odds with the common sense understanding of empathy, which most of us would, would consider a public good. You know, it's something we teach our children. Uh, and in America, I understand that some hospitals actually um, charge higher insurance fees when they employ, when those hospitals employ doctors who have not had empathy training. So there are very different ways of regarding it, um, I think, in the common sense versus scholarly worlds. So I'll move on now to Bleak House. And of course, um, the contemporary retort to, um, as I'm suggesting, to Uncle Tom's Cabin was this very well-known novel published first in serial form between 1852 and 1853. And I'm aware that we have a Dickens scholar in the room, actually. Those who ha so can I just ask, um, again, has anyone here read Bleak House apart from Grace? So a few people, yeah. Certainly that's a lot better than my students, I have to say. <laughs> So, for those who haven't read it though, the story is primarily focused on the fortunes of Esther Summerhays, Summerhays um, an orphan who eventually finds a haven in the so-called Bleak House, which is actually a warm and happy home. One major narrative thread contrasts Mrs Jellybee's mission work, so here we see Mrs Jellybee, um, and indeed the missionary arm of the church at the time, with the neglect of poor little Joe, the crossing sweep, who's another character in the novel. So Mrs. Jellybee spends her time on, on the African mission, uh, Boriabula Gar, while her own children go dirty and hungry and her house is a mess. And we see that um, summed up here. And in fact, I think we also see an image of the anti-slavery medallion, the kneeling shackled slave, on the mantelpiece. So although a minor character in Dickens' novel, 
the white waif Joe quickly became a popular figure in his own right, escaping from the original plot to feature in stage performances, photographs and art, and becoming an emblem of the homeless waif. Like Uncle Tom's Cabin, stage performances also circulated across the colonies, and what contemporary audiences relished most about the work was Joe's miserable life, and especially his pathetic death. They loved it. So here we see a painting by Frith. Um, Joe is talking to Lady Dedlock. And on the left we see a very well-known photograph um, by the, um, uh, the, the well-known photographer Oscar Rylander. So audiences, as I say, they love the pathos of Joe's story. Uh, homeless, penniless, continually moved on by the police, he existed on the verge of starvation and disease, eventually dying in a long drawn out scene that ended with a direct appeal to the reader's sympathy. So again, you know, very emotional kind of, you know, tugs at the heartstrings. Images were highly effective at the time in arousing compassion for waves, as demonstrated by their use or imitation for publicity by charity. So here we see Rylander's well-known image and he's kind of reproduced this sense of revelation as a policeman's uh, bullseye camera. Um, exposes this little boy in a corner by painting on this sort of shadow over the top. And then the image is reproduced on the cover of Bernardo's periodicals, so, you know, Bernardo's Homes for, for Children um, and these fundraising periodicals. So the novel established an emotional and moral opposition between Mrs. Jellybee and Joe the Crossing Sweep as the novel's most powerful object of compassion. And um, so I think you can see this beautifully summed up here in Tenniel's uh, cartoon from Punch magazine where Britannia is peering through a telescope at a distant African scene where the missionaries are sort of declaiming to the Africans. I don't know whether you can see the detail. Whereas at her feet, a little uh, London Arab is tugging at a skirt and saying, please, ma'am, ain't we black enough to be cared for? So it's this ironic kind of suggestion that they're, ca that they're caring too much for the distant um, indigenous person. <clears throat> so Joe's touching story circulated very widely across the colonies and New Zealand as well as Australia of course and was put to work in making sense of, of local circumstances. Very rarely missionaries applied the story to argue for helping Aboriginal people upholding the biblical injunction that, that I've referred to often glossed as charity begins at home but reversing its original racial logic. However it was far more common to invoke telescopic philanthropy in denigrating black Australians and advocating concern for whites. In 1899, for example, the West Australian fulminated against what Dickens calls telescopic philanthropy. So the journalist argued for the innocence of two white men who'd been accused of murder, suggesting that um, had they been convicted of one of the fashionable foibles, and it, it, it used the very offensive term nigger flogging, um, they would not have been uh, sentenced in the way that they had been. So in its colonial appropriation, this principle simply substituted racial for distant others with the effect of, a, of excluding Aboriginal people as undeserving of protection. So I want to jump forward now. Oh, sorry, so this is the quotation. I want to jump forward now to examine debates about relations between Britain and Australia in the present, and especially visions of the nation's future. The movement of empathy between our British empathy, our, our British heritage, symbolised by the royal family, and especially the Queen, um, an independent Australian nation, and Aboriginal Australia, continues to structure the way Australians feel about their identity and the future. Historian Mark McKenna suggested in 1996 that a republic has always been considered the end point of the, um, the colony's political development. And he suggested that this was an ideal that would be fully realised when Australia finally matured into an independent nation. Yet for more than two centuries, the notion of inevitability has been used to delay the coming of a republic as much as to urge its arrival. So the royal family represents a domestic ideal that continues to evoke loyalty, admiration and love. As historian Jane Connors noted in her brilliant analysis of Queen Elizabeth II's 1954 royal tour, 
this is, it's a wonderful PhD. It's one of the few theses I've ever read that made me laugh out loud, you know, quite often. Um, she noted that, so Jane Connors notes that even a bicentennial protest marking a climax of popular and indigenous challenge to the state, respect for the monarchy meant that large sections of the protest crowd, including me, had felt a strange reluctance to actually shout at the Queen. <laughs> So I think until the late 1980s, the meaning and role of British royalty uh, in the modern world was not a significant object of academic research. After that time, so from, that, from the late 1980s, the time of the bicentennial in Australia, for example, more critical analysis began to consider how it is that in a country which, which proclaims itself to be the home of democracy, um, a family, this ancient institution of inherited status, continues to thrive. Why is the British public obsessed with a family possessing incalculable wealth? So one answer that's been suggested is that since the 19th century, the royal family has served a key purpose in making constitutional uh, monarchy intelligible to everyday people. And it's this sense of identification because they're a family, just like all families, but also difference because they're incredibly wealthy, privileged, they're aristocratic, and they lead a very unusual way of life. Um, and the idea is that this allows the unprivileged to accept their position in relation to extraordinary wealth and status. So resentment and envy, it's suggested, <laughs> is also contained by noting the high standards required of the royal's personal behaviour, including great emotional restraint and especially the constant media persecution they endure, which have instead become prompts to pity and sympathy. And I'm talking here about sociological research conducted particularly in Britain. The Queen's customary expressions of emotions, including cordiality and kindness, and more importantly, her suppression of emotions such as anger, are behaviours that mark her as aristocratic. So I don't really have time to go into this, but I think that the fact that we find this so amusing, you know, when you Google angry Queen or bad Queen, and of course some of these are photoshopped, um, but the fact that they're so unusual, I think, we so rarely see the Queen frowning and even when she is I mean we, we, we tend to assume that she's there's probably a horse misbehaving or the corgi doing something wrong so you know it, we, we we understand the Queen very much in terms of her her kind of her demeanor and her emotional comportment so however royal watching or popular royalism has often been, been seen by both public commentators and by historians as frivolous overly feminine and a form of sentimental fascism or hegemony that disguises class or imperial interests. This is the way that serious historians have often framed it. And in fact, more than historians, I think. Some critics continue to invoke notions of indoctrination in seeking to account for its popularity. But as Jane Connors suggested, the enduring perception of royal watching as trivial may be because it has been labelled a female interest with hysteric tendencies. Such contempt continues to characterise arguments made against the retention of constitutional monarchy in Australia. The gendered and emotional nature of Republican visions, which tend to be nationalist, masculinist, future orientated, optimistic, um, stand in discursive opposition to the monarchy, which is seen as familial, nostalgic uh, and, uh, and female. The imperial bond has been sustained by public spectacle and especially royal visits um, to Australia and no doubt to New Zealand as well. Um, and of course this reached its zenith in the decade after the end of World War II, uh, fuelled by shared participation um, in conflict. But for many in Australia from the 1960s, emotional attachments to empire were increasingly transferred to the landscape of war memorials. Uh, so for many Australians, military valour and sacrifice have increasingly provided a focus for the modern uh, culture of nationalism. I can see a question coming later. <laughs> um, however, in telling the triumphant nationalist story, of, and of course this, this is our, the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, soon to be upgraded by a very lavish um, uh, official investment. Some of you may have been to it. It's the most visited um, cultural institution in the country. But in telling the triumphant nationalist story of Australia's establishment of a free society, its shameful obverse has often been omitted. And that is, of course, the history of Indigenous dispossession. So 
Um, and we have a, a number of recent studies that have explicitly shown this, including a book by um, historians Jesse Mitchell and Anne Kerthoys, uh, who, who mapped very clearly the way that the establishment of liberal and democratic institutions, such as universal male suffrage and the secret ballot, relied upon the process of excluding and denying the rights of Indigenous people. One consequence of this denial has been that Indigenous people have often sought to invoke royal sympathy as a transcendent and more just authority than the state. So we see an example of this going back to 1863. This is a deputation of Kulin elders, that's Tangarong, Wurundjeri, um, Bunurong people who were at that point living um, at a place called Corrindirk. They walked 41 kilometres into the city to attend uh, the Governor General's um, Leve and they, they made a formal presentation as if to the Queen um, and considered this in, in almost in, in clearly very diplomatic terms. Or again, in 1954, a group from Milingimbi in Arnhem Land travelled to Toowoomba to perform um, white cockatoo, emu and brown hawk dances for Queen Elizabeth II. In 2011, relatives of the original performers travelled there again to perform the same series of dances. Following Princess Diana's death in 1997, slightly different case because Princess Diana's death and mourning I think is quite a phenomenon in and, on and of itself. But again, here we see this, this remote Aboriginal community conducting elaborate um, mourning rituals for Princess Diana. So again, I think this points towards the community's affection for Diana um, as participants within a vast global community of mourning. Most recently, as part of Harry and Megan, Megan's tour of Australia last year, the royal couple visited Kigari, um, or Fraser Island in Queensland, and met with the Bachella people. Kigari is part of the Queen's Commonwealth Canopy Conservation Project. Bunjalung lawyer Danny Larkin noted that it feels as though the royals represent a sense of modernisation and progression compared to the representative democratic regime that governs Australia. This is quite remarkable. And she argued, um, seeing a modern royal couple prioritise our own land conservation more than the Australian government does is the ultimate example of just how disrespected and politically powerless we truly are. For the Australian polity to progress, the political and legal sovereignty of the Crown and Indigenous Australians must be realised and embraced as two coexisting sovereignties that are not at odds with each other, but have a relationship built on mutual respect and work together. That was, um, that was last year. By contrast, visions of national independence as embodied by the modern Republican movement have been profoundly gendered and white. And this is a much younger Malcolm Turnbull, more recently our Prime Minister. Um, who, and and um, Turnbull, of course, um, uh, led the, the 1990s Republican, Australian Republican movement. So the 90s were a decade of intense debate about a republic uh, and um, Prime, our then Prime Minister Paul Keating was also quite prominent in that discussion. Some began to explore a republic as a vehicle of inclusion but Mark McKenna, the foremost historian of the republic, points out that there were few signs of women or Aboriginal people nor did the campaign speak to social justice or equality. Women remained highly critical of the Republican vision. The historian Marilyn Lake, for example, noted in 1996 that monarch monarchists in Australia are often discredited for being unable to separate from the mother or for being literally old women. Typical Marilyn Lake, very pithy <laughs> quotation. Republican discourse constructs the national story as a white man's story. So I think in our very masculinist Australian political culture, an opposition persists between the supposedly feminine emotional private sphere, symbolised by the monarchy and its adherents, and the rational male public domain. I think that's you know, more than ever we see that uh, in, our, in our public culture. So, as you may know, in 1999, Australian voters rejected, um, it, through a referendum, rejected a proposal to establish a republic. But I think few analysts then or now have, have really seriously attended to the familial, emotional uh, and, and traditional aspects of these imperial ties. They either reduce them to sentiment or they ignore them together. And we often see the language of 
gushing emotions, slavering, drooling. You know, we see this evoked all the time to describe those people who are royal watchers or monarchists. So it's a kind of a very dismissive stance that I think is quite damaging to the, um, the Republican cause. However, as we've seen, many Australians hold a different view. And for them, I think the authenticity um, of the monarchy rivals that of the Republican vision. Perhaps this also helps to explain why Britain, seemingly so remote from the grim business of dispossession, has escaped recognition of its profound complicity. By focusing the authority of the British Empire upon the effective relationship between the people and a loved and respected member of the family, these political meaning, meanings may be evaded. And I think a really good example of that um, at the moment is that a historian, Jenny Hocking, who has a um, biographer of Gough Whitlam, has published several volumes of, of a series, um, has uncovered links between the dismissal in Australia and the knowledge um, of the palace. So in 1975, the Governor General dismissed our then Prime Minister Gough Whitlam. Uh, th this was seen as outrageous, tremendously controversial, but people said the Queen did not know. So Jenny Hocking has uncovered evidence that suggests that actually there was quite close correspondence between the Governor General and the Palace at the time. But the Palace has embargoed this correspondence held in our National Archives and it's currently the subject of a court case um, which is proceeding to the, um, the Supreme Court. So just to finish, um, one implication of this recognition is that we must bring together debates about a future Australian nation and the omnipresent vision of, of a republic with those regarding the status of Aboriginal people. This is certainly the view of our First Nations people whose Uluru statement from the heart seeks constitutional reforms and the establishment of a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making with government and truth telling about Australian history. Aboriginal lawyer Megan Davis argues that republicanism in its legal and political potential, invites the nation to engage in a, in a discussion of a much grander vision of nationhood and structural reform than the 1999 version. The First Nations appeal from the heart seeks to harness the radical potential of empathy to claim recognition and inclusion in the national community. Thank you. Thank you.